Wow, today's topic really is very timely. It touches all of us. And everybody's talking about it this week after Oprah's speech, especially at the Golden Globes. Did everybody see Oprah's speech? <laughs> Pretty incredible, wasn't it? I'll, I'll, I'll read you a quote for those of you who did not see the speech, although I won't do it justice because her delivery was amazing. But she said, for too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dare speak the truth to the power of men. But their time is up. Their time is up. We cannot talk about women's issues without discussing the momentum of the Me Too and the Time's Up movement and how it's really changed and rocked our world in some wonderful ways. We are going to leave time to explore some of those topics towards the end of the program, but we want to begin with kind of a narrow focus on local issues here in Austin that are impacting the community. Uh, the recent study that Melly mentioned uh, by the Women's Fund of the Austin Community Foundation, it was very clear that when women are economically secure, safe, and healthy, that's when communities thrive. So in particular, we want to look at housing, education, and child care. And we have three women up here today who can certainly bring those topics to life in so many great ways. Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett is president and CEO of Houston Tillotson University. And I gotta tell you, she's, she's only been in Austin since the summer of 2015 and she is blazing some trails. She's made a huge impact as a strong proponent of not only education, but true civic and community engagement. She sits on many local and national boards and has co-chaired the Mayor's Tax Force on Institutional Racism and System Inequities. <coughs> Sorry, I have the cedar fever like everybody else. <laughs> Hold on one second. <coughs> everybody have cedar fever or the flu right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, right? Next, we have Delia Garza, council member from District 2. <coughs> and Delia, I'm going to get you to put your microphone down just a bit more. So you, oh, you, when you, she's coughing too. <laughs> it's a theme. Um, she's a member of the Austin City Council, obviously the first Latina to win election to the council. She was also the first Mexican-American female firefighter in the Austin Fire Department. She is a mom too, and she's quite a trailblazer herself and has been leading the charge at City Hall for several of the women's issues we're going to talk about today, particularly child care and child care deserts in our city. And finally, down on the end, we have Shannon Moody. If you're in the nonprofit world, I'm sure Shannon is a familiar face. She's now the executive director of Austin's Jeremiah program. This is a nonprofit having great success, bringing families from poverty to prosperity in, in, in some very unique, meaningful, empowering ways. She has been involved in the local nonprofit world for 25 years on countless boards in both fundraising, and she's also a strategic planner in the nonprofit world. So I'm so thrilled that you all three are here today with us, and I can't wait to dive into some of these topics. We're going to get started. Some of the statistics are just, well, they're just mind-boggling. I'm going to read a couple of them to you. Three out of four Central Texas jobs don't pay a living wage for a single mom with two kids. 57% of Central Texas students are not ready to enter kindergarten. 86% of low-income children in Travis County with working parents live in a subsidized child care desert. How do you even start to tackle these issues when it's such a broad, complex set of obstacles, really, in the way of a lot of women? Who wants to start with that one? Dr. Burnett, you're here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the ball to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Judy says, who wants to start with that one? Colette? <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Colette. <laughs> um, I, I wanna say something about Oprah's speech. Um, every time I watch it, I cry. Like the ugly face <laughs> cry. <laughs> and the reason is, because it invokes in, in me an emotion of the, what she says, a superpower that we all have is to tell our truth. And all these issues are people's stories and they're the truth. 
And the reason it makes me cry is because it feels overwhelming. It's like a sense of sadness in a way, and then a sense of hope. Because her story, what she says in that speech, she has, it's sad, but then it's hope. So when we think about all these big issues that are bigger than all of us, and they seem daunting, the reason that we as a nation do not move forward on uh, surpassing, fixing, et cetera, these issues, is because we lose the will. I'm going to say that again. We lose the will because it feels so overwhelming. Women are very strong people. We make humans. <laughs> That's a superpower. We cannot lose the will in our own spaces to move forward on these issues. In your own life, if you vote, if you talk to other people, if in your job you are equitable in, in your hiring and how you see things, those things may seem small, but if all of us did that and fight towards removing injustices, we will make movement. That's what warriors like Oprah Winfrey, Rosa Parks, John F. Kennedy, the list goes on and on and on, because they have a will to move it forward. So when you feel overwhelmed about these issues, look forward towards to, to be hopeful, because the end of the speech, she says, a new day is on the horizon. And that's very powerful. So crying for me is cleansing and gives me energy. And I do cry every time I watch it, third time now. <laughs> so I want to encourage you to not be overwhelmed, but instead in your own life, think through how you can, I hate to use the term move the needle, it's so cliche, but it's a, an analogy, how you can make change, whether it's on health care, um, safety, education, et cetera. And of course I'm biased and I'll stop with this. Education is the great equalizer. Um, when students and people say, well, as a college president, why are you interested in what happens in K-12? If our young people, if our babies enter kindergarten not ready, then they're going to enter high school not ready. They're going to enter college not ready. They're automatically at a disadvantage. So education is that great equalizer. And thank you. I want to point out before we go to Councilmember Garza that Austin is one of the few large cities in the nation that has a majority female City Council. Yay. That's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Councilmember Garza, let's talk about some of these complex issues. Sure. Um, we also have a majority uh, county commissioner's court, too. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. This, um, this and a female, community and a fe and a female sheriff one. and a female DA. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're great at progressive here. <laughs> we are great. <laughs> <laughs> um, ways that the city of Austin has continued to tackle issues like this, and um, I can speak about the council generally, and then I can speak about policies that are important to me, um, you know, uh, budgets, it's often said budgets are moral documents. And so we really have, as a city, committed a lot of funding to all kinds of um, nonprofits, all kinds of contracting that we do through our public health department that help families. Um, some of the, some of the um, biggest budget amendments I have made have had to do with increasing funding to health and human services, funding for um, child care and addressing policies such as um, the, the, the gender gap in, in wages for the city of Austin. In a lot of ways, we can't, because of um, preemption by the state, the city can do so much with regards to pay. We can only control the pay of our city employees. Um, we can't dictate how private employers pay, but we can be a good example. Um, I, I wanted to start by saying, and I, I forgot to do this, um, I wanted to thank the men that are in the room today. It's so, as Judy said, these are, this is not this women's issue. This is not, we know this issue. You know, we don't, we don't we need to We live it every day. We live it. We live it. Um, and when the majority of the, 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 the intro, introduction, she made a great point about being a boss, and she said, you know, that, that, that maybe she hadn't been, been the best boss. And then when the majority of our bosses now are still men, it's important for the men to be in the room to, to really understand these issues. One thing is, as, as a council member, um, it was the first time I've really been a, a boss boss. Um, you know, I have a staff of, of four, and I wanted them all to know that, that they never had to, to, to come and explain to me some child care issue. Um, I have always told them, I have all, all female staff right now, if there's anything um, you, you want to go read to your child in the morning, go to lunch, please don't, don't ever feel like you have to ask me or explain anything, or I, I get it. And so I. Um, I think it's important for, for everybody to understand that and, and to, be, um, to be good examples. But it, it touches, these issues touch every single issue 
that I deal with, whether, whether it's rates for Austin Energy, that, that's, that comes out of your budget, your, whether it's your water bill, whether it's land development um, issues, those all touch this issue. And, and, and my general goal has always been, I don't want another working family to have to leave Austin because they can't afford to live here anymore because it's happening all the time in my district. I have one of the lowest, I represent one of the lowest income districts and they're leaving and they're going to Kyle and they're going to Pflugerville because they can't afford to live here anymore. And so every time, it, whether, even if you think an issue is so far from childcare or, or housing, um, I'm thinking about how does this affect our most vulnerable? And that's what guides um, my vote. And so, you know, I'm also on the Capital Metro Board. And as we're changing routes, I'm thinking, how is this going to affect a mother who has no other option but to get on the bus, get to the bus stop, um, get, get, get to childcare, then have to wait for another bus to go across town? And so it, it, it affects everything we deal with at the city. And it's constantly that, something that I'm thinking about. I want to talk a little bit more about childcare, but first I want to I go to, to Shannon and, and, and <coughs> housing and childcare certainly plays into what you all do with the Jeremiah program. Th this report by the Women's Fund showed the majority of single moms who rent spend more than 30% of their income just to keep a roof over their heads. I mean, right. ha they're housing burdened. Um, how does housing fit into the picture for the, the, the single moms who are trying to get an education, get back on their feet that, that you all serve? And talk about your model a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm so excited to be here because this is what we do. Um, the mission of Jeremiah program is exactly to cover all of these shortfalls that unfortunately are in our community. Um, Jeremiah program provides safe and affordable housing. We have on-site high quality early childhood education. We have support for a career track education for all the moms that live with us. And we also have life skills and empowerment training all within a supportive community. And this population, they don't have these supports that, that you know, probably you and I had going through college, hopefully all our children had. So we um, support these moms to get their college degree at the same time getting their kids kindergarten ready. As we've all said, this group recognizes more than anyone I've probably ever talked to how important that is. So at Jeremiah Program, affordable housing is, is probably one of, I, I can't say one is more important than the other. I think that we have five cornerstones that make the model work. And affordable housing is a huge piece. A lot of our moms had to quit their college you know, dreams because they couldn't afford um, an apartment, couldn't afford childcare for sure. All of our moms are at the 30% poverty level, which is about $18,000 for a family of two. A lot of our families have two children. So you can imagine college was not a reality, um, especially high quality early ch childhood education. So um, all of our moms only pay 30% of their income for, for their rent and the great thing about Jeremiah, which I love, is that if they lose their job for whatever reason or if they're in between jobs, they do not, their, their residency is not um, an issue. We support them throughout their journey going through towards their degree at the same time getting their kids ready for school. I want to drill down on the education issue and, and get, get that aspect of this covered from your varied perspectives. Um, Colette, the Women's Fund showed one in three women in Austin feel limited by their current skill or education. So how do you see some ways we can ensure women break through some of those barriers where they, they just feel so limited by what they can accomplish in the workplace because they don't feel like they have the skills or the education? First of all, I want to uh, commend Leadership Austin. I'm, I'm, I'm on the board, true transparency. <laughs> um, um, it's a phenomenal organization for having these kinds of forums for people to, to talk and discuss. Do not leave here today without doing two things. One, getting to know someone that you don't know, and two, complimenting another woman in the room. Whether it's your hair looks nice, you look good today, um, you got on some nice shoes, whatever it is, compliment and uplift each other. That's something that women do not do and that's building a sense of confidence. And that goes to Judy's question about confidence because I got my doctorate very late in life at the age of 55. It's because I had fear that I wouldn't be able to do it. 
And after I did it, in hindsight, it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> but my own fear was stopping me. And young women, I see it all the time. They don't have the confidence. They, their lives feel very big that they cannot do it. So I think as a society, because higher education specifically is unaffordable for most. At my own institution, over 80% of my students are Pell eligible, which means they come from families of incomes of $30,000 or less. So education becomes unattainable in their minds. And as a nation, we have to invest in education. It was originally, education was supposed to give everyone a fair and equitable chance for a prosperous life. And education now has ironically become the great divider because we are creating the, a, a larger gap. Um, the second thing I want to do is commend the Austin Community Foundation for doing this study and for having the Women's Fund. Don't leave here not taking this with you because there is power in data and there's power in information. And this brochure has data in it that shows that women are at a quote unquote disadvantage now. So back to saying education is the great equalizer. It is affordable but you have to dig deep to find those resources. And middle income people know how to find resources. I mean, educated people, Texas has a um, 60 by 30 goal. 60% 60 of the population will have some kind, form of post-secondary education or cert certification after high school by the year 2030. The state of Texas will not reach that goal with middle to upper income white people because those people are already going to college. The people that are not going to college are brown people and low income people. So Texas has an obligation to make higher education affordable for those people if, they are ser if we as a state are serious to achieve that metric of 60% of the population to be educated by 2030. It's not going to happen with poor people suddenly hitting the lottery and being able to go to college. That's just ridiculous not to invest in it. So in your lives, and I, I really like what um, was said earlier about in our lives, everything that we do and vote on actually impacts something in, those, in these areas because you don't think it does. So in your walk, pay attention to what's happening in your local politics, your state politics, and at the federal government level when it comes to investment in education. And I say this a lot, as a nation, we invest in what we want to and we operate to fear. Um, before 9-11, we didn't have the TSA. We didn't basically undress to fly. But we as a nation built a whole arm of the government as a response to fear. So if we truly want to invest in educating Americans, we have to have the will to do it. And that is because of individuals like yourselves and what you do. So if you donate to a scholarship fund, if you, inv if you engage yourself in a high school, in your own children's school, if you get students college ready by, and by volunteering at the library at your school, those are little small things that come from our hearts but actually have an impact. I see it every day. And women, we, I mean, you know, I, I have this hashtag black girl magic. The black women in the room will understand that, you know, it's like magic. And women, we have that magic. So that lack of self-confidence, we have to instore it in each other. We have a way of not lifting each other. Um, and roses don't look at each other and say, oh, I'm a yellow rose and you're a red rose, I'm prettier than you. They just bloom where they are. So I encourage you to uplift another woman, the women that really need to hear these things and find out all of the resources that are available in a city like Austin, like the Jeremiah program. They, it's hard to market those things. And the women that need to hear those things are not in this room right now. So we have a responsibility to reach those women and not be just a have and say, oh, that's happening to the have nots. Because it's not just happening to the have nots, it's really happening to the haves as well. Because if, if the city of Austin wants to truly be the prosperous city that we say it is, then all people have to have opportunity. And opportunity comes from investing in being able to have a good education, to be able to have good health care. It's embarrassing to be in a city that the data in, the, in, a, in a brochure like this, because everybody thinks about South by Southwest and all the beautiful things that come out of Austin. And I love Austin. 
That's why I've invested myself into being like someone that's a warrior for injustices, be it race or be it discrimination against women. Because even as a college president, Judy and I were talking the other day, you know, I sit in a room and I say something and then a male says something and people say, oh, that's a great idea. And I just said that. <laughs> so it still happens to me um, because I'm a woman. So I have to have my approach to be able to address that so that it won't continue to happen to other women. Because if I sit back and let it continue to happen to me, I'm making that environment be okay. And it's not okay. So I truly advocate for you as individuals to do something in your own life that impacts someone that doesn't have the privileges that you have. And, 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 and encourage young women to, be edu to go into education. Encourage, if you're a teacher, encourage people in your classroom to be a teacher. If you're a scientist, find a woman and encourage her, a young woman, to be a scientist. Because people are watching you. And it's really up to us as individuals. I can't say that enough. As women, we are, as, as women, we are great at adapting. Um, and we're having some audio issues with these microphones as far as with our Facebook feed. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys to kind of step back a little from your microphone, but when you answer, I'm passing the mic down to you, okay? So it, it may not be pretty, but it's going to work. Um, we want our friends in Facebook land to, to hear all these great words of wisdom that you all have. Thank you, Colette. We're going to talk to uh, Councilmember Garza because we've been using this term... Um, child care desert and for a lot of people we've heard of food deserts some people probably have not heard of child care deserts and this is an issue you're very passionate about you're the mom of a youngster who's in in daycare at that age preschooler and we really have to start this education of women and people in our community to equalize at a very young age so i'm passing the microphone to council member garza to talk about what we're doing at a city level and, and the resolution you introduced So there's, um, you know, I've learned so much about this. It's, as, as a mom, you, um, you become experts in so many things. You get really used to Googling things. Um, and Is that a rat? <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, so there's, there's child care and there's quality child care. And um, during discussions of, so the, so the cities, when I was talking about, these issues come up in, in so many different ways, even though they don't seem directly related. And the city um, builds a lot of things. We have a lot of property, um, or we have a say, or we give authority to, to, to what can be built and how it can be built and, and those kinds of things. And so um, when this happens, for example, there's gonna be a development at the Highland uh, where ACC is now. There's gonna be a city, um, a city facility there. And I've seen it time and time again where, as we're having the discussion of, um, you know, we're going to start building this building and, and what can we put there. And the two things that, that always get talked about but never get put in, um, regardless if it's a city facility or a private development that the city has some kind of, a, of, a, of input in, is grocery stores and a child care facility. And it gets, it gets talked about a lot, but when, when, when that facility gets built, there is not a grocery store. <laughs> or a child care facility. So in the last discussion about um, what was going on at the old Highland Mall site, it came up again. Um, grocery store wasn't one of them. That's, that's not a food desert area, but child care came up. And the response was, um, well, that area is saturated with child care. And I just couldn't believe that that, that, that was the case. Um, so we did some research and we, we found that, that there is, and, and even this report, this great report speaks to that and says the number of children under six years old, there is not, in the entire city, there's not enough child care available. And so I wanted it to stop being lip service when we talk about um, the need for child care throughout the city, quality child care. And quality child care is different because, because it's, there's requirements. Um, it requires a schedule, it requires, and I'm not the expert in that, I'm sure there's this a better experts in this room, but it requires certain things. And the United Way has done an amazing job of, of showing how there's such a there's so many children that could have access even to pre-K, but they don't know. There there would stay at home moms that are not not stay at home because um, they can afford to stay at home. Th it's it's because they they would basically be working just to pay for childcare. So for many of those families, 
um, they, they make the decision that it's just easier to stay, uh, to stay at home and it makes it even harder on many of their families. But the, the, uh, the latest resolution that we've been working on is to determine what the need is throughout the city. In my district, which is Southeast Austin, um, there are only two uh, quality child care facilities, two. Um, and there's 80,000 plus people in, and I, my district also has the most families because it's also the last affordable place. So, so um, I'm really excited to see that we have a working group right now. Some of you might be on that working group and we're having those discussions of what can the city do to provide affordable, high quality child care. Um, because when, when children, so many children entering um, school right now aren't even ready for, for pre-K or kinder because it's you know their first time they're, they're, they're from a family who couldn't afford any kind of early child child care um, and so they haven't had you know they haven't learned their ABCs or one two threes or not in a place and so when you already start behind you're already at a disadvantage and so um, I'm looking forward to seeing what that what that resolution what that working group brings forward and I, I really hope that that we can um, uh, get that some kind of child care facility in the, in the um, Highland um, development. We are remote from that too. Um, let me check in on the audio. Joe, Joe and Blair are wonderful decibel team. Is that okay? Chris, did you want me to keep passing the microphone? Okay. So, yep. Shannon, your question. I, you know, what we're going to want to hear about from the Jeremiah program, I'd love for you to share Marissa's story that we talked about before we start questions from the audience because sometimes these real life anecdotes Absolutely, and, and Marissa's story, unfortunately, is not unusual. And she was gonna be here this morning. She was very excited to come. Um, she wanted to see how this all worked, um, but she has a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and she's working part-time, and she's going to school. So you can imagine, she was running very far behind. We said, please, no, take care of your family. Um, and I'm happy to share her story because it's amazing. She's one of our very first residents at Jeremiah Program. She had her first little boy when she was 14 years old. She is smart as a whip. Um, she took it upon herself to graduate from high school. So she went to a special high school, graduated at 16 when she was pregnant with her second son. So she now has two children and she was 18 when actually her dad saw um, a little news clip about Jeremiah program on, on TV and he said, oh my gosh, this is the answer. Um, so she moved in, she is um, doing incredibly well, but you can imagine how hard it is, um, you know, the work that she has to do on her own to go to school, to work part-time, to take care of these kids. Um, and if she was here, she would share the story about how much her sons have learned, because we do have a high quality early childhood education um, center on campus. Um, we'll be fully accredited once we're open a year. And um, luckily, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you said because we will open up any spots in East Austin. We're in, um, we're right behind the Eastview ACC campus is where we're located. Talk about a desert of all kinds. Um, we will open up any of our spots for community kids. So um, Marissa is just a shining star um, in our Jeremiah crown. Um, and I invite you guys all, please reach out to me and come tour our campus, see what we're doing. It really is an incredible um, organization that, that solves all of these problems in under one roof. Okay. For our questions. Away. Yeah, we have a really great and engaged audience, lots of questions. Um, I'm going to try to pull out some themes and summarize what the audience wants to know. This um, has been touched on a little bit already, but the audience wants us to take it deeper. How, how do we address that this issue affects minority women mm. more so than anyone else? What are some of the ways that we can really talk about that and address it? How does the how do the issues of poverty, childcare, housing challenges impact minority women in a bigger way? Is that kind of the, oh. how do we address that? There's an easy yeah. one, Colette. Go ahead.
Nation is about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's song, in April. This nation is about to celebrate, or not celebrate, um, com um, commemorate, recognize, or live through, I'll say, the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's um, assassination in April in Memphis, Tennessee. His famous I Have a Dream speech could be given today, and we would think that he wrote it in 2018. That's sad. So that's because of systemic racism and continued toleration, uh, to, to continue to tolerate in this nation, treating people less than and different simply because of the color of their skin. We tolerate it. We have a president that uplifts things that are abhorrent to this nation as far as our, our, our morals and our ethics. That's just not okay. So when the question comes up, how do we address this when it comes to minorities in particular, we're tolerating it. We're not watching a movie, it's happening. If you are the only white person in your workplace, you are a part of the problem. If you um, have any biases, you don't want your children to be around other people that don't look like them because you fear for their safety, you are part of the problem. If you are a person of color and you have um, made it and you are living in your privilege and not in tune to what's happening in this nation and you tolerate it, you are a part of the problem. Small thing, in this book that I'm encouraging everyone to read, it has in there some data about subsidies in child care. And I'm going to read it exactly. It says, Through the Texas work for, though the Texas Workforce Commission provides child care assistance to parents that work, attend school, or participate in job training, such as the story of Melissa, Marissa, Melissa, Marissa, Marissa, and there are more Marissas than we know. I see them every single day. Only half of child care providers in Travis County accept these subsidies. That's racist. Your child care provider doesn't accept that subsidy. Why do you take your children to that child care provider? Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's very powerful. If you make a statement to say, I'm taking my child, child to a child care that doesn't accept a subsidy because subliminally someone doesn't want the children who come from families that get subsidies to be in their child care center. That's just a fact. And we are tolerating that as a nation, and it's just not okay. So to the question, what do we do about it when it comes to minority women, because statistically, women, black and brown women, black and brown people are of the, purport, the large proportion of this data. And that's not new as a nation. 50 years, and we're still fighting what the ADL calls the good fight. So either you're in it or you're not and the majority of Americans clearly are not. So I challenge you to in your own life, do something, have the will, and not just come to nice breakfasts and have a conversation with people and then walk into your regular life and not do anything. And it could be a small thing that doesn't feel big to you, but it will have an impact. Like invest in programs like the Jeremiah program. Um, go through your closet and give your clothing to, to, to uh, organizations that allow women to have nice clothes to go on an interview. Seems small, but that's big. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Council Councilmember Garza, do you want to tackle this one? Or do you want to go? Go I ahead, do, and then we'll then we'll move on to the next question. The question was um, addressing it for women of of color. Yeah. Color. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm trying to make this as short a story as possible. Um, so I grew up in San Antonio. I, I think a big. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll make the statement first. It's important to have um, for our brown and black women and and anybody to see people that look like them in leadership positions, and to have those people at the table. Um, um, when these decisions are getting made, when you're making budget decisions, um, the, the seven out of 10 women council members, uh, my first year on council, I was able to get, increase the health and human services budget by almost six and a half million dollars. That had never been done before. And, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and, 
along with obviously the support of my colleagues. I couldn't do it alone. You need six votes. Um, and when that happened, a former council member reached out and, and, was, and said, you know, I, I tried and I tried and it could never have happened under the old system. And I think that's for different reasons, but I think it also has to do with the fact that there were seven women on the council and that they, and they, they prioritized that. Um, with regards to you know, having people that look like you in leadership posi positions, that matters to, to children. Um, I grew up in San Antonio and it, it's, it's such a, it's only an hour away from here. And I'm amazed at, you know, when I, I, uh, I didn't know I was a minority in San Antonio. Uh, the mayor, Henry Cisneros, was Hispanic. The police chief was, the fire chief, all, they were all. And so I, I've often thought, had I grown up in Austin, I wonder if I would have um, the same desire to, to achieve or, or, or I, I think I would have been, I think I would have led a different life, honestly, if I had grown up a Latina in Austin. And so um, things that we can do to address that is we, we support people of color that are running for office. Um, we, we give to organizations like Con Mi Madre, who has done an amazing job of getting Latinas ready for college. And, and um, in one of my budget I items, I was talking to the executive director of Con Mi Madre, and, and I was trying to push um, um, pregnancy prevention because the majority of of women that have children, they're under the age of 18 and have children, and some of them, two children under the age of, of 18, are Latinas, and many of them come from my district. And so I was trying to, you know, does your, does your organization do pregnancy prevention? And she said, you know, we don't actually talk about that, but it just happens, because when you're talking about you know, telling them and, and motivating them and giving them self-esteem and telling them you can go to college and you can be better and you can make good decisions, it happens naturally that, they, that then they say, you know what, I'm not going to get pregnant or I'm going to do the things that need to be done to, to not put myself in that position. So it's, so it's supporting uh, uh, women of color that are running for office. It's, it's, so they're at the table making those decisions. It's giving to organizations that support um, uh, minorities is, is a way that we can help address that. Let's do one more audience question. We have a lot of questions about collaboration in terms of government, nonprofit, corporations, and we've heard a little bit about that. Um, a lot of a lot of about policy. How specifically? We've heard a little bit about uh, government and, and nonprofit. Where do corporations play a role? How, how can they help influence the policy um, and practices that we need here in Austin? Good question, because there are a lot of people who work for large corporations in the audience. Um, Um, collaboration is such a key part of tackling these kinds of issues uh, because we have limited funding as a city. Um, we we have to you know we have so much need, but then we also have to make sure we're not raising property taxes for people and driving them out. And so, um, so many of the wonderful things I've seen happen for my district have been a combination of private funding and um, and and public funding. Um, in, in, at the Dove Springs Recreation Park, for example, is a beautiful um, playscape area, and St. David's was a big part of that. Um, the Arst Austin Parks Foundation was a big part of that. Um, many of the things that uh, don't get the attention, you, you, you made the great example of the, of the uh, FTA, the, um, the, the, the security at airports, um, the TSA. Um, they, you know, we need that same kind of priority when we're talking about these kinds of issues. And so um, th this child care facility that I'm hoping to uh, possibly get I in the ACC uh, area, that's going to have to be a collaboration with private. So a lot of private funders in here, child care facility, ACC. Um, <laughs> I'll be in touch. Um, you can't, you know, collaboration with, sh uh, sh the doctor's been a great, um, for our, our um, the task force, the um, she's done Hands amazing. On institutional racism. Yes, yeah. yes, um, it is key. It can't we can't have these silos of, of just government and nonprofit and you know education. Um, we have to we have to be thinking about how to tackle these together because of the limited funding and, and see how um, one of the things we were able to fund is there's a gap in when a woman is there's there's subsidy funding for childcare when. Um, women are going through workforce programs, but then when they're done with the program and start looking for a job, they actually kind of lose that funding. And so we were able to find funding for that gap. For, so when they're finished the, the program and they're, they're now looking for a job, you, you need childcare when you're looking for a job. Um, they're, they're, uh, we were able to match with Travis County. We, we work with Travis County and, and they said, you know, we can, 
you know, we can't full it, we can't fully fund what they're asking for, but we can give, you know, 150,000, and 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 so it, it's collaboration is so key to, to um, to getting all these great initiatives done. We only have about 15 minutes left, and I promised everybody we would talk a little bit about the Me Too Time Up movement. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> My phone started talking to me, uh, <laughs> and it was a male voice. I'm a little worried. Um, how can we, tr to, to kind of a two-fold question, how, how has the Me Too Time Up movement impacted your arena, and how can we translate this empowerment and this movement into um, legislation or, or something that can be funded and enforced and, and truly make a, a difference, a lasting difference? I, I actually that will allow me to say what I was going to say about collaboration. Um, within corporations, I encourage you. Um, I came from the corporate world to have women's groups to talk about like experiences because you think you're isolated. Like with sexual harassment, you got caught in the copy room and someone touched you inappropriately, and you think it just happened to you. And if you have a safe space of collaborating within the organization, then, and if you have a stronger, a woman that has a very strong personality and makes a really safe space where you can be trusted in that area, that's, a, that's the key thing, that it is a safe space and there's trust there where women can be open to share what their experience is in that particular corporation without being criticized or looked down upon or be politically incorrect. So if there's a woman that's have, having that experience from a particular person, male or female, in the, um, because men are sexually harassed as well, um, so the, in that particular workspace, in that safe space, if she can say that's happening to me too, there is strength in numbers. So that that woman in her own individual world is feeling like it's just happening to me. If I have this kind of, if, if I have this, this group of women that are having a, a coffee hour or a wine hour or a happy hour or breakfast every other Monday or something like that and build relationships among each other as opposed to competing with each other, then you can create an environment where a woman can say that's happening to me too. Hmm. Even abuse at home. If you see a woman that you see something is happening in her life, if you have a safe space, women, people will open up to each other and we can, we can elevate each other. Um, during the introduction, Melly talked about um, the power of the, the, the group that came up with, these, with the, to, to get to the, the um, Women's Fund. That happened from a group of people talking. This will then get the attention of people like the councilwoman. And then she's more informed of what's happening in people's everyday lives so that in her space, then when things come before her to make a vote, to, to, to do a vote or to say, hey, we keep talking about this child care desert, but we need to do something about it. I think that's how it elevates itself to become policy, not just on the local level, but the state level, and really importantly, the federal level, because it's the federal government that has a good impact on poverty. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the federal government, like the new tax bill, <coughs> that has an impact on people's lives. Do you want to, yeah, did, before we do, we're, we're almost time for a call to action, but if either one of you want to touch briefly on, on the Me Too movement in, in your arena or just how you think we can translate this momentum into, into action. Yeah, um, many of you might remember. I, I, I think it's, um, we have to keep calling people out is what it comes down to. Um, when, when, uh, when my first year on council, Many of you might remember there was a controversy over the women oh, in training, yeah. <laughs> and um, and I was a new council member. Um, I, I I I remember getting a text late at night from another council member, and it was a link to that. And, and for those of you who don't know, there was unfortunately someone hired to to train the city of how to deal with a majority female uh, council, and that they would they would ask a lot of questions, and they weren't good with numbers. This was, this was said, um, and it, it was sponsored by the city. Um, and and um, I, you know, I, I got that text, and I just, I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. 
And so, you know, I called my chief of staff, and thankfully she was, she worked for another council member, so she knew, um, you know, what we needed, you know, I said, we need to have a press conference, we need to do something. And um, I was eight months pregnant, seven, eight, yeah. And um, I, you know, even though I, I, I ran a campaign and everything, I, I'm, I still was getting comfortable being behind a podium and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I had to lead this press conference saying that we, that, that that was ridiculous, that that was embarrassing, that the city of Austin should not be um, sponsoring a training like that. Um, and I, I remember I got a little emotional probably because I was eight months pregnant. And, um, <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm, I'm about to have a daughter and I don't want her to ever have to have a press conference like this to say that this is not right. And so um, I think we keep, we keep calling it out. We, um, there was a Texas Tribune um, talk yesterday about what's happening in the legislature, and um, I saw a tweet that said not a single male legislator showed up um, to be at that at that talk, and I thought that that's just that's really sad. That that uh, we 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 need it. We need people need to be in the room. They need to listen. They need to, you need to have these hard discussions. Um, that's the only way we, we have progress if we continue to have these have these discussions. Shannon, I'm actually going to have you start the call to action as well okay. uh, because we have about five minutes left and we, we want to make sure that, you know, each of you gives this audience an, an actionable way that they can make a difference in some of the issues that we've talked about today. Um, it's, it's how we end every Leadership Austin Breakfast is we, we give people information, but we also want to give them ways they can act on that information in their own lives, in their own businesses and neighborhoods. Okay, Shannon. so specifically just for, I would say, for my perspective from Jeremiah program, um, a call to action if, if you feel so moved to help young, strong women making their way, come be a tutor at Jeremiah program. Um, be a mentor. Come be a life skills facilitator. Um, if you are even wanting to jump in deeper, we have empowerment facilitators that go through 150 hours of training to teach our empowerment course, which talk about the Me Too movement. Um, we didn't even realize that this would be helping that movement, but it teaches every one of these women that it is your birthright, that you are lovable, valuable, and important. And if you can hold that dear, you will speak up if someone does something that is not with your values. So that would just be my very small, personal call to action that would help Jeremiah program. I know that there's much broader information that these lovely ladies it, will share. It takes a village. Yes. Great call to action. Councilmember Garza. You know, I think an easy one would be to, you know, if, if this child care facility ever comes to fruition um, to support that. But, but there is a big issue coming up, um, Code Next. And, and as I said earlier, these things affect the most vulnerable, the people that have come out to speak about this issue, which is our, we're forming a very antiquated land use code, um, they're the more affluent people, the, the people that have the ability, as, 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 uh, as Doctor said, um, the people that need our help, I feel like the people that need government's help the most are the ones that aren't in this room, that can't be in this room, the, what was it, Marissa. Marissa's, um, that can't be here. As we're having this, this discussion of, of, of reforming our land development code, um, I think it's important that uh, we understand that something needs to change as of how we build, how we use land. Um, it's not working now. There's, there's vestiges of a discriminatory and prejudiced um, past in, in the current land development code. And um, families don't have, families in my district don't have the opportunity to read a, read a thousand plus page document and um, inform themselves but the reality is something needs to change, it needs to be reformed, and that will help families. That will help keep families in Austin if we allow, and I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but, but please pay attention during Code Next and, uh, and, and, and understand that um, really the families that are affected most, it's, it's these kinds of issues that we chip away at and we help when we have more progressive policies and that is, is everything from our land use policy to how we set rates for Austin Energy, um, it, it's, it's, it, it, all that is, is, part of, is part of this discussion. We can take little bites and hopefully make an impactful difference. Finally, Dr. Burnett. Valerie Jarrett, um, for those of you who don't know her, she was the uh, second in, um, 
President Obama's right-hand person throughout his administration. And I saw her speak um, last week. And she said, this is the day of women. So I encourage you to think about that. Um, majority council, majority uh, commissioner's court, um, um, female president of one of, of Austin's oldest institution of higher learning. There are a lot of women in power in Austin. Um, people have positions in Austin. People have, women have a seat at the table, to quote Solange, the great philosopher. Um, so I encourage you to catch that vision, to make it a movement. And a movement means people are moving and doing something, not just nice talk, but you catch the vision because it truly is the day of women. And our nation needs healing. And what are women? We are healers. We are natural caretakers, natural nurturers, um, natural relationship builders, natural huggers. So it is the day of women. And let's take advantage of that and not let it pass us by because we were sitting back and thinking someone else is going to do it because the someone else is you. I cannot thank you three women enough for, for sharing these words of wisdom and making us feel inspired and empowered to go out and, and make a change in our lives and in our communities that will help women embrace this moment in time. So thank you all.